Let us turn in our Bibles to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 1. 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. <coughs> As I was uh, going through some boxes recently, uh, I came across some correspondence uh, between Kyung Ju and myself in the weeks prior to our marriage and uh, reminded me of just how much communication has changed uh, since then. Kyung Ju was back in South Korea and I was at home in Scotland and due to the extortionate prices, and this is what some of you younger people won't appreciate, the extortionate prices of international phone calls in those days, uh, we had to find other ways of communicating. A man in the church I belonged to had a fax machine in his factory office, which was about three miles away, and Kyungju's father, thankfully, had a fax machine, and so that is how we communicated for a few months. I would write a letter, take it up to the factory, and my friend would send it through his fax machine to South Korea. My friend would then notify me uh, when a reply from South Korea arrived through his fax machine, and I would travel the couple of miles up to his office to pick it up. Without running up a massive phone bill, that was the most efficient way of communicating. It was a reminder of how we communicated prior to the days of mobile phones and email and FaceTime and Facebook and all the rest of it. And some of you older people are perhaps thinking to yourselves, well, <laughs> you shouldn't complain. At least you had access to fax machines. We in our day had to rely on Royal Mail. And in response to you, the Apostle Paul would have said, at least you had royal mail. <laughs> we had to rely in our day on word of mouth. And that is precisely why these opening chapters of 1 Corinthians are what they are. It's because of what Paul has heard by word of mouth. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 8 indicates that Paul is writing from Ephesus and although he is several hundred miles away from Corinth, we hear him say in chapter 1 verse 11 that some from how Chloe's household, they must have traveled there, some from Chloe's household have informed me of what is going on within the Corinthian church and it's not all great news. Because sadly, there are quarrels among you. And amongst the many issues that Paul will address in this letter, there is this one that will dominate the first four chapters. And as he starts to address it, we hear several things. The first is in verse 10, and there we hear an appeal for unity within the church. An appeal for unity uh, within the church. Now, if you were here last week, then you may remember that uh, Paul said that one of the consequences of the grace that God has given us, verse 4, is that we have been called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, verse 9. And now that we have reached verse 10... Uh, we hear Paul say that uh, that same grace has not only brought us into relationship with Christ, it has also brought us into relationship with other Christians. And that is why Paul can address these Christians in Corinth as brothers in verse 10. It's a very intimate term. And please note that horizontal relationship between us as Christians is a necessary consequence of the vertical relationship between us and Christ. It's a necessary consequence. And that is why the New Testament nowhere, nowhere envisages a lone ranger Christian living an isolated, independent, autonomous Christian life. You don't find it in the New Testament. Well, as you read through 1 Corinthians, you might be thinking to yourself, well, <laughs> what a mess that place was in. I mean, the church. 
What a mess that church was in. If I had been living in Corinth back then, I would have, I think I would have opted for the long ranger approach. I would have just got on with living my Christian life by myself. I would have found life challenging enough back then without the additional challenge of belonging to a church like that. And consequently, I would have had nothing whatsoever to do with it. Would you have been tempted to do that? Because the church seemed to be in such a mess, you would opt for the Lone Ranger approach. The interesting thing is that Paul does not consider that an option. He still called it the church of God in Corinth, back in verse 2, and he assumed that those who were sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, he assumed they were a part of it. Like everywhere else in the New Testament, there is the assumption that having been brought into relationship with Jesus Christ, Christians will be living out their Christian life in fellowship with other Christians within the context of the local church. And now that we've reached verse 10, we discover what that fellowship ought to look like in practice. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. In other words, it ought to be a fellowship that is characterized by unity. Now, when the subject of Christian unity arises in the Bible, and it crops up quite frequently, it's important, always important, to remember two things. Firstly, it is not we who create the unity. True Christian unity has already been established through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Rather than create it, our responsibility as Christian people is to do all that we possibly can to maintain it. Secondly, it's always important to remember that there is a difference between unity and uniformity. Uniformity is when everyone looks the same, sounds the same, thinks the same on every matter under the sun. Uniformity is when personal taste and personal preference is replaced by a rigid conformity to a given standard on everything. And the result is that every person simply becomes a clone of the next person. If you've ever seen pictures of a military parade in North Korea, then that is uniformity. Nowhere does the New Testament suggest that the, new that the church will be characterized by such monochrome uniformity. Especially when a Rugby World Cup is taking place. But although not demanding uniformity, Paul is demanding unity. Unity on the core, crucial, central truths of the Christian gospel. And it is in relation to those things that he appeals for unity in verse 10. It is in relation to the truths of the gospel that he asks that we be united in mind and thought, or ESV, that we be united in mind and judgment. And the reason he appeals for unity on those things is because it is only as we are united on those things as a church that we'll be united in our purpose and in our goals as a church. It is only when we are united on those things, the central core things of the Christian gospel, that we'll make a common and a correct judgment as a church as to what is true and what is false, as to what is right and what is wrong. As you read through this letter, you discover that the church had failed to make a correct assessment and a correct judgment on a whole host of issues. They had failed to make a correct assessment and a correct judgment on a number of theological issues, practical issues, and moral issues. They had done so because, as we'll soon discover, they hadn't always appreciated the moral and the practical and the theological implications of the Christian gospel. 
They were not united in their thinking on those things, and consequently they were not united in their judgment concerning situations that arose in the life of the church. That's why Paul appeals in these verses that they be united in thought and judgment. Do you see how different the unity Paul is asking for how different that is compared to much that is described as religious unity today. The common approach to unity today is that if we are going to successfully bring people together, then we'll need to reduce everything to the lowest common denominator in order to get everyone on board. And once you've got everyone on board, you don't want to think too much about what you believe if you're going to keep everyone on board. And you certainly don't want to be making too many judgments as to why and what is right and wrong, as to what is true and false. Such an approach to, we're told today, destroys unity. And yet that is the very thing that Paul is asking for in his appeal for unity. Please note, he doesn't ask that we abandon doctrinal convictions or theological judgments, but instead ask that we be united in our thinking and in our judgment concerning such things. That is true Christian unity. And where it exists, there will be no division amongst us. So please note, we'll still have a personal taste and our personal preferences on many things. Many things about which the gospel has nothing to say. We will have our personal preferences on those. But on the many things which the gospel has something to say, on the many things which the gospel has an implication, we will be united. And that is Paul's appeal for unity within the church. And just in case you want to dismiss, dismiss Paul's appeal as being rather naive. Oof, how does he ever think that's possible? Where did he ever get that idea from? Well, before you dismiss his appeal as being naive, let me remind you that he wasn't the first person to make such an appeal. Somebody else made it before him. Do you remember the, what the Lord Jesus prayed in John 17, speaking about those who would subsequently believe in Jesus through the apostolic gospel? Jesus said this in verse 21, I pray that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. And if such oneness ought to be found anywhere, Surely it ought to be found within the context and the confines of the local church. That is an appeal for unity within the church. Secondly, verses 11 and 12, a cause of division within the church. As is usually the case in Paul's letters, his appeals and his instructions and his corrections, they're not just random, plucked out of nowhere, but instead are made in the light of the particular situation that he is addressing. And if ever that was true, it's true here. The reason he has appealed for unity in verse 10 is because there is a serious lack of unity within the Corinthian church, verse 11. Some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas, i.e. that's Peter. And still another, I follow Christ. Now, having established uh, this church three or four years earlier, there were some people who would still have remembered Paul, those who were the original converts and made up the original members of the church. And there would be those who still remember Paul and would have had the greatest of respect for him. 
Acts 19 informs us that following Paul's departure, a man called Apollos went to Corinth and was a great help to the Christians there. And consequently, some within the church thought very highly of him. They were greatly helped by him. There's no mention of Peter ever actually visiting Corinth, but it may just be that because of his stance on Jew-Gentile issues, some of those within the church from a Jewish background perhaps thought the world of Peter. Paul, Apollos, Peter, and last but not least, there are some who say, I follow Christ. Now, in one sense, everyone within the church followed Christ. <laughs> That's what made them a Christian. But opinion is divided as to whether this fourth group are right or wrong in saying, I follow Christ. And some people think that they are no better than the rest and that they have reduced Christ to the level of the other three names mentioned and are simply using his name to appear superior or super spiritual compared to the rest. Others suggest that Paul includes this reference to Christ in order to shame the congregation for having given their allegiance to anyone but Christ. And if you've got an opinion on either of those views, then come along on Tuesday night and share it. But whatever your views on that may be, the important thing to realise is that the four people mentioned were not the cause of the division. That's important to realise. It's not Paul, Apollos, Cephas or Christ who are the cause of division, and therefore they were not to blame for it. The problem was not with any of these three or four individuals. The problem was with the Corinthian Christians' attitude towards these various individuals. Instead of focusing on Christ, they had adopted Christian leaders as their heroes and they had exalted them to such an extent that their allegiance to that person was in danger of becoming the defining point of their Christian identity. And it was in danger of becoming the defining matter in their fellowship with other Christians. You see, it wasn't merely that some remembered Paul with great affection. That was only natural. The problem was that viewing Paul with great affection became the criteria of their attitude towards their fellow believers within the church. And so not surprisingly, what happened over time is that all those who thought the world of Paul very quickly became a little Pauline clique within the church. And those who thought the world of Apollos became the Apolline clique within the church. And that's how it continued. And that's how it led to it being a divided church and a quarreling church. That was the cause of their division. And sadly, such behaviour continues to divide churches today. And I'll give you three examples. Being a Reformed church with a Reformed confession of faith, and if you've never read our confession of faith, then uh, do let us know and we can send it to you. But being a Reformed Church with a Reformed Confession of Faith, some of us have the greatest of respect for those men of the 16th century who were known as the Reformers. Some of us identify with their theology to such an extent that we would call ourselves Calvinists. That's how I would define myself theologically as a matter of convenience. And if you want to know why I do so, then come along over the next two Sunday mornings and you'll see I'll try and justify that. Uh, but, uh, and therefore, I'm not dismissing the use of the label altogether. But what I must always remember is that I'm a Christian first. And the Calvinist second. And the test as to whether I'm maintaining that distinction correctly 
Is my attitude towards those in the church who are Christians, but who wouldn't necessarily use the label to describe themselves theologically? Do I love them as brothers and sisters in Christ? And do I appreciate and value my Christian fellowship with them? Or do I allow my Calvinism to become the criteria for determining who I fellowship with? And who I don't. If it is the latter, then it would seem that I'm a Calvinist first and a Christian second. And that's what creates cliques within churches. And that's what eventually divides churches. Example number two. Where you have a plurality of leaders within a church, and by the way, that is the biblical model. The New Testament is very clear on a plurality of leaders within a church. But wherever you have that, there is always the danger of the Corinthian division occurring at a local level over local church leaders. 2,000 years on, and human nature hasn't changed one bit. Certain people rally behind a particular leader, while others rally around one of the other leaders, and they do so to such an extent that they give that leader an unhealthy loyalty and an unhealthy allegiance. For example, whatever that leader in the church says, they will back it. Whatever decisions are to be made in the life of the church, you can guarantee that they'll be on that person's side. They wouldn't dream of questioning them or contradicting them. And consequently, what you get over time is a church which has little cliques of people, each rallying around their particular little leader. And if allowed to continue, such behaviour results in a divided church. A church that is divided over its leaders. Then in addition to that danger arising over local church leaders, it can also occur today over our global church leaders. And on hearing that phrase, you might be thinking to yourself, oh, that's a little bit strange. I thought we were a an independent evangelical church. I didn't know we had global church leaders. Who are they? Well, let me explain. We are privileged, and I mean that, we are privileged to live at a time when excellent Bible teaching and good solid theology has never been more accessible. Due to the internet, there is no end to the amount of good, solid, biblical reform material that you can listen to. No end to it. And when I hear of the amount of people that access such material, and especially people from places where Bible teaching churches are few and far between, I think it's so exciting, so exciting, that God is using both the teachers and the technology of our day in such a remarkable way. But through no fault of the teachers, there is always the danger of Christians elevating such godly and gifted men to a level where it can become unhealthy, unhelpful, and even divisive. For example, within most churches today, you will find some who listen regularly to one or other of the two Johns. You don't need me to explain. You know perfectly well who they are. And that's great. That's great. We've got our personal preferences, especially when it comes to preachers. And so there's no problem whatsoever with that. But the problem is, when the two Johns become the defining criteria of our Christian fellowship, and we form a clique within the church which consists of those who listen to our John and excludes those who listen to the other John. That is the last thing that either of those two men would want to happen. 
And that is the last thing that Paul would have wanted to happen. Example number three. We live in a part of the world which has a great history and a great heritage of hymn writing. We have great hymns by Isaac Watts, Charles Wesley, Augustus Toplady, and last but not least, William Williams. But what we must always remember is that in sharp contrast to our Bibles, there is nothing to say that the canon is closed when it comes to our hymn books. And consequently, we also have great hymns. And we've just sung one of them by more recent hymn writers, such as Stuart Tarnend and Keith Getty. And would you believe it? <laughs> if we've all got our personal preference over our preachers, you can be sure we've all got our personal, personal preferences when it comes to hymns and our hymn writers. And can I emphasize there is nothing wrong in having a personal preference? But the problem is when your personal preference with respect to hymn writers becomes the defining criteria in your attitude towards your fellow Christian. For example, if you're an Isaac Watts follower, you actively seek out those in the church who belong to your camp and share your preferences of hymn writers while keeping your distance from those who belong to that other camp. And likewise, if you're a Stuart Town End follower, you gravitate in your fellowship to those who share your personal preference. And if possible, you avoid those whose allegiance is different. And I use the word allegiance deliberately. Because that was the problem in Corinth. And that is the problem today. When our personal preference, when our personal affection, when our personal admiration for someone, whether it be a preacher or a hymn writer or a theologian or a church officer or whoever, the, chain, the danger is when such people become the object of our allegiance to such an extent that we are not only unable to question what they say or what they write, but we also treat with suspicion those of our fellow believers who don't happen to share our allegiance. That's what causes cliques within churches. And that's what eventually divides churches. It was the cause of the division in Corinth. And it continues to be the cause of division today. Thirdly and finally, verses 13 to 17, and there we see a challenge to a divided church. A challenge to a divided church. Now, having exposed the divisive and destructive behaviour within the church at Corinth, Paul proceeds in verses 13 to 17 to challenge such behaviour, and his challenge to them has three strands to it. Firstly, he does so by asking the question, verse 17, is Christ divided? <laughs> is Christ divided? What a strange question. And you may be thinking to yourself, of course, the answer is of course not. Of course not. There is only one Christ and he always has and always will exist as one person. So if that is the case... then why are localized expressions of the body of Christ so often divided? And please note, divided mostly over things which have no doctrinal implications whatsoever, but rather are a matter of culture and personal taste and personal preference. Is Christ divided? Of course not. And so neither then should be a localized expression of the body of Christ. 
Second strand to his challenge, verse 17, was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? What is interesting with this one is that he's highlighting the error, not of those who follow Peter or Apollos, although the very same argument applied to them, but to those who followed Paul. <laughs> and you might think, why is he doing that? Well, the reason for doing so was probably because no one could accuse him of sour grapes. If he had said, were you baptized into the name of Apollos? Did Apollos die for you? Some people in Corinth might say, ah, he's a bit petty. He's just annoyed and taking the half that people are following Apollos and not Paul. And so to avoid that from happening, he takes himself as the case study. And he says, was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? To those who have elevated him or anyone else for that matter, to an unhelpful and unhealthy status, he asked the question, was Paul crucified for you? The answer is, of course not. It is Jesus Christ who was crucified for us. It is Christ's name that we've been baptised into. And so that being the case, says Paul, why would you ever give an admiration and an adulation to me or anyone else for that matter, which is due to Christ and to Christ alone? Why would you ever give it to someone else? And if you want a more recent illustration of that response... Then just listen to Martin Luther on discovering that the first Protestants were being called Lutherans. He said this, what is Luther? The teaching is not mine, nor was I crucified for anyone. How did I? poor stinking bag of maggots that I am, how did I come to the point where people call the children of Christ by my evil name? If ever anyone had a way of making his point, it was Luther. And his point on this occasion is a challenging one. Unlike Luther, Paul is eager to distance himself from an admiration and an adulation which is unhealthy, unhelpful and devices. He's keen to distance himself from a form of allegiance which belongs to Christ and to Christ alone. And that is why on seeing the attitude of the Corinthians, that is why Paul is so grateful that he had baptized very few within the church at Corinth. For verse 17, Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And that leads us to the third strand in his challenge. Now, this is the first of many references within the letter to wisdom. And on this occasion, Paul is differentiating between his preaching of the gospel and the wisdom of this world. His repeated attacks on human or worldly wisdom suggest that that is where the Corinthians were going wrong. He doesn't critique and criticise worldly wisdom over the next few chapters for nothing. He does so because he thinks that is where the Corinthians were going wrong. They had rallied around their heroes and they had given them their allegiance because as far as this world was concerned, that was the wise thing to do. That was the cool thing to do. You had to say, who did you follow? Although they never had social media, they still liked to follow people back then. And being a society which had its fair share of influence and at the same time was obsessed with eloquence and rhetoric, these Corinthians thought that by following their man, they would grow in wisdom and power. When in actual fact, they were in danger of drifting from the source of true wisdom and power, which as we'll see next week, is the message of the cross. And the reason why Paul brings up the subject of the cross here is because that is the remedy to the divisive and destructive partisan spirit within the Corinthian church and every other church since then. 
And if only they and if only we many years later would return as a church to the centrality of the cross, then they and we would be delivered from chasing after this world, from chasing after its wisdom and its supposedly wise way of doing things. Returning to the cross of Christ will help us appreciate afresh the grounds of our salvation and therefore the grounds and bases of our unity. It will remind us that we are saved through the finished work of Jesus upon the cross and therefore there's only one who deserves our undivided loyalty and allegiance and that is Jesus Christ. Returning to the cross of Christ will humble us afresh and cause us to realise that we are no better than our fellow believer within the church for whom Christ also died. Or we may have different personal preferences from them. And that's fine. Paul is not asking for uniformity. A difference in personal preference is fine, but what we must always remember is that the Christ who loved me and gave himself for me is the same Christ who loved them and gave himself for them. The centrality of the cross was the remedy for the division within the church at Corinth, and it continues to be the remedy for the division within every other church since then. I say that because as we will discover over the coming weeks, the cross of Christ is incompatible with the wisdom of this world. And that is what Paul means when he says in verse 17 that if he had preached the gospel with words of human wisdom, the cross of Christ would have been emptied of its power. The two are at odds with one another. And therefore, the more we are focused on the cross of Christ, the less likely we are to imbibe the wisdom of this world. A worldly wisdom which caused the Corinthians and us many years later to say, I follow this preacher or that theologian, this hymn writer or that church leader. The remedy for such a divisive partisan spirit, says Paul, is the centrality of the cross of Christ. Three things we hear Paul say concerning the local church. Firstly, an appeal for unity within the church. Secondly, a cause of division within the church. And thirdly, a challenge to a divided church.